Thank you very much. It's, it's always a wondrous occasion when, before you're even fully introduced, you've been invited out for a drink. <laughs> and so, uh, definitely the anchor bar. I was expecting you were going to tell me I had to come back and give a talk about Grover Cleveland. <laughs> and then I would have the Buffalo trifecta, right? <laughs> so what does one say who holds the McKinley chair when you come here? Uh, the first time I came here was right after I received the chair, and I said I came with a bit of trepidation, and there were actually a couple of people in the audience who kind of seemed angry about that, uh, but I think we're safe. I should point out that while McKinley sadly was assassinated here, when he mustered out of the Ohio Volunteers in 1867, he went to the closest law school he could find to Northern Ohio, which was in Albany, New York. And so he's actually an alum of Albany Law School, where I teach. Millard Fillmore is a complicated figure. And most Americans, of course, know very little about Millard Fillmore, other than that he has perhaps the weirdest first name of any American president. And it goes down from there. Um, he is little remembered, and no one quite knows why he was there. So I'd like to give you some perspective on that. Uh, I should say that there, what you're going to hear would not make Millard happy if he were alive today. This will not be a particularly flattering talk. But I want to start out on the upside by pointing out that there are a number of pieces of Millard Fillmore's life that were really quite wonderful. And this institution is one of them. As probably many of you know, he was one of the founders of the Buffalo Historical Society. He was also the first chancellor of the University of Buffalo. And indeed, in many ways, Fillmore's greatest accomplishments were right here in Buffalo. His greatest accomplishments were as a city builder, as an institution builder, as a man who understood the importance of his own city. And probably of all the things he did in his two and a half years as president, the thing that he probably liked the most was to sign a gigantic public works bill which was known as the Harbors and Lighthouse Bill. And as you might guess, a significant of that amount of that money went to New York State, and a good deal of that New York State money went to dredging the harbor on Lake Erie and to fortifying some of the other pieces of the infrastructure of Buffalo's water harbor and its connection to the Erie Canal. So in fact, in many ways, Fillmore was a great civic booster. Fillmore was born in Cayuga County in Sempronius, New York, on Lake Skinny Atlas, about 25 miles from Auburn. Ironically, of course, as a New York politician, his greatest rival would be William Henry Seward, who moved to Auburn as a young man and made his career as an Auburn politician. So here you have, within just a few miles of each other, Fillmore and Seward, the two rivals in the New York State Whig Party. He grows up as an impoverished farm boy, uh, he is probably the second or third least prosperous person in his youth to become president in the 19th century. Uh, in many ways, he parallels Lincoln, although Lincoln probably grew up in even greater poverty. One of the differences between Fillmore and Lincoln is that Fillmore grows up in rural upstate New York, which means there are public schools. And so he gets a kind of rudimentary education through about age 13 or 14, when his father apprentices him to work in a textile mill. Later on, when the mill is closed during the Panic of 1819, America's first depression, he enrolls in a local academy to kind of get as much of a high school education as he can in one year. I'm not sure how much education he gets, but what he does get is his teacher, Abigail Powers, who four or five years later he marries. And uh, so at least he has an instructor in the White House uh, for his career as president. Uh, in 1820, the Fillmores leave rural Cayuga County and move to East Aurora, which is quite frankly, in those days, pretty much the middle of nowhere. It is today, of course, a suburb of Buffalo. But in those days, it would have been a long day's horse ride into Buffalo. 
And in 1822, when he is now a full majority, over 21, emancipated, he moves to Buffalo, teaches school, works for a law firm, and after only a year of clerking at a law firm, his, the lawyers in the firm and other lawyers in Buffalo go to the local court and petition the local court to admit Fillmore to the bar early because he is such a smart guy and such a hardworking guy. So if you can imagine Millard Fillmore in 1823, recently admitted to the bar, about six feet tall, by the standards of the time, strikingly handsome, from the middle of nowhere, uh, deeply insecure about his social status, always dressing as absolutely properly and conservatively as possible to in fact hide the fact that he's not quite secure where he is, reading constantly, trying to improve himself, had just been admitted to the bar, and what does he do? He leaves the firm in Buffalo, he leaves Buffalo, and he goes back to East Aurora to practice law. Why? Because there are no other lawyers in East Aurora, and so he figures he will have no competition. He later tells people he went back to East Aurora because he was afraid to practice law in Buffalo at the time because he didn't know enough. And this personal insecurity, this uncertainty about who he was will haunt him in many ways for the rest of his life and will have a dramatic and not particularly helpful impact on his presidency. In 1826, at the age of 26, because he was born in 1800, he goes back to Cayuga County and finally marries Abigail Powers uh, and then brings her to Buffalo, where East Aurora, where he is now a prosperous lawyer. And one can imagine the transition in Fillmore's own mind. He left East Aurora on foot, the impoverished son of impoverished farmers, who in an age when owning your own farm was the most important thing, the Fillmores had lost their land through um, either fraud or not being very smart about the land they bought. They had been renters. They were at the very bottom of the social status. And Fillmore returns to East Aurora, returns from East Aurora in a carriage with the nicest suit he can buy to marry his sweetheart and bring her to East Aurora, where she continues to teach school indicating perhaps that Fillmore is not as financially well off as the carriage and the clothing would have implied. It's also, just as a footnote, Abigail Powers becomes the first first lady to have worked outside of the home in American history and the first first lady, of course, to have worked after marriage. Other first ladies like Jacqueline Bouvier would work before she marries John Kennedy, but after marriage, she, of course, would not work. But Abigail Powers works both before and after marriage, and it would be a very long time into the 20th century before we would have first ladies who had worked outside the home either before or after marriage. In 1827, Fillmore becomes involved in politics. He begins to give speeches at something known as the Anti-Masonic Party. Now some of you will scratch your head and say, what is the Anti-Masonic Party? Well, it's just what it says it is. It's a political party dedicated to stopping the vast, dangerous conspiracy of the Masons because people in western New York and Erie County believed that the Masons were part of an international conspiracy to take over America. Uh, the Anti-Masonic Party begins when a stonemason named Morgan disappears in Erie County. His body is never found, and the claim is that the Masons assassinated Morgan because he was going to reveal the horrid secrets of the Masonic Order. Um, the real motive of the Anti-Masonic Party was as a stalking horse to fight off Andrew Jackson, who happened to be a Mason, and Martin Van Buren, who happened to be a Mason, because everyone knew Andrew Jackson would be running against the incumbent John Quincy Adams in the next election. But Fillmore is clued into this. He is simply giving speeches to the anti-Masonic party, and he buys into this fear of a huge Masonic conspiracy. Of course, next time we see the Shriners riding around in their little motorcycles with their hats, we can begin to wonder, uh, what was he thinking? 
but it gets him elected to the state legislature, and he's elected.